Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Hauser with Friends of the Chicago River, and welcome to my summer, my Chicago River Day Summer Challenge presentation on native plants. And uh, we're going to get going here in just a second. I know everybody is on mute, but uh, if you have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat and we will respond, hopefully in real time. And let's get going here. Uh, this is one of a series of presentations for the Summer Challenge in lieu of doing a large cleanup on one day at the Chicago River. We decided because of COVID-19 that we we're going to do a series of presentations about the river and river issues. And this is the one on Centennial Volunteers Restoration and Floristic Quality Assessments. So how do we go about getting more native plants into the ecosystem? specifically with Centennial Volunteers and our restoration programs, and how do we assess that we're doing the job right? Uh, I, I welcome you to join uh, the presentation in, I believe it's uh, two weeks, with uh, Adam Flickinger. He's doing envisioning and creating a blue-green corridor along the Chicago River, and then you're certainly welcome to come back. I have another presentation on September 12th, about combating climate change at home. And then we're gonna have a big celebration with Annette Anderson and others uh, in September uh, to kind of wrap up the summer challenge, share you with, with some data that you've been collecting along the river. Uh, and pursuant to that, Music. we have uh, many great sponsors for the Chicago River Day and transitioning to the Summer Day Challenge or the Chicago Summer Challenge uh, Exelon, PepsiCo, RBC, Mars Wrigley, a lot of great sponsors for this event. Specifically, I'd like today to shout out to uh, Schulze and Birch Biscuit Company. They're a long, long time sponsor of Friends of the Chicago River and Chicago River Day. Uh, have done a lot of work cleaning up the uh, Bubbly Creek area. And I just wanted to mention uh, Jim McBride their vice president, he has uh, been a very involved and very uh, supportive of Friends work for many, many years throughout the Flatwater Classic and Chicago River Day. So a big thanks to uh, Schulze and Birch Biscuit Company for sponsoring this today. To participate in the My Ch Chicago River Day Summer Challenge, what you would do is uh, pledge online at chicagoriver.org. If you do that, then you can actually obtain uh, guidelines as to how to do your own cleanup along the river. You, you can even coordinate with Annette to get buckets, grabbers, gloves, and masks. You record your cleanup data, take some photos, and then post them on the My Chicago River Day Summer Challenge map so that we, at the end of the summer, have all this collection of efforts that you've been doing to clean up the river so that we can actually show you what, what the collective effort has been. Uh, and you can actually promote your, what you've been doing through the hashtag lose the litter and hashtag litter free Chicago River uh, and promote what you've been doing and share what some of their efforts have been. So I encourage all of you to do that. Also, you can support friends by becoming a member. Uh, members receive the River Reporter, our newsletter, information on current projects, uh, and events and other benefits and things like that. And right now, this is an interesting opportunity because if you join as a member right now, uh, you are actually, your donation is matched three to one by the Illinois Clean Energy Community Foundation. So definitely think about becoming a member if you are not. Okay, enough of the, uh, the background. Let's get to the presentation today. This is why you're here. Hopefully all of you have an interest in plants, native plants specifically, maybe some of you even work in this field. Um, but we're gonna talk today about what makes a plant native, non-native, invasive. We're gonna talk a little bit about biodiversity and why it's important. Uh, I wanna share a lot of good photos of people doing work out in the field, show you some of the techniques and some of the ways we go about getting more native plants into the ecosystem. And then we're actually gonna end with a little simulation. We're gonna actually do our own restoration right on the computer. So hopefully that sounds interesting to you. If you have any deeper questions, you certainly can contact me. Uh, my email is mhauser 
at chicagoriver.org. Just to start, uh, Friends of the Chicago River has been around for 40 years. We celebrated our 40th anniversary last fall. Um, it's been 1979 since we were created. And we go about improving and protecting the Chicago River system for people, plants, and animals. That is our mission. We work in three program areas, education and outreach, such as our schools programs, our bridge house museum, paddling programs to get people out on the river, on the grounds projects like res restoration and working with native plants, uh, dam busting, things like that, on public policy and planning efforts to increase water quality and stormwater retention and looking at land use, land use development. So we're working in a lot of different areas. Uh, and if you're interested in any more information about any of those, we can certainly help you with that too. So I'm gonna start the presentation with just a real simple question of defining some terms. What is native? What, is, what do we mean by a native plant? Well, I have my own personal definition. This is kind of out of the dictionary, so if it sounds a little formal, that's, that's probably why. But a native species is one that is found in a certain ecosystem due to a natural process, such as natural distribution or evolution. In other words, it has been there for a very long time and just belongs in that place. So a native species has evolved with the surrounding habitat and can be as assisted or affected by new species. So when other species come in, they can affect that community. And that's what we would call a non-native species if it doesn't belong there. So non-native plants have characteristics that maybe don't quite fit with the, uh, the rest of the plant community. Here is an illustration showing you some prairie plants. Um, Illinois is the prairie state and was once covered by uh, vast prairies. Uh, all of these plants have deep root systems so that they can withstand drought, uh, fire, and other things that they actually evolved with so that they can thrive in that kind of ecosystem. Uh, your turf grass that you see on your lawn is actually mostly Kentucky bluegrass, which is not native to our area, has a very shallow root system. And if it is uh, affected by the same kind of drought, as everybody knows, if you're a homeowner, if we have a drought, that grass turns brown and you have to go out and water it. Uh, and that is not something that a native plant would have a problem with. There's actually a movement to put more native plants in your yard. Therefore, you don't have to worry about mowing it as often. You don't have to worry about watering it as often, especially in a time of drought. So a non-native species just usually has a different characteristic and it doesn't play well with the others, is how I like to put it. On a whole nother level is an invasive plant. And this is, it, an invasive plant I define as being non-native, but it really harms the ecosystem. It goes beyond just being non-native. Uh, and an example would be uh, your kudzu. Locally, uh, buckthorn is another one. Um, they just get into an ecosystem and if left unchecked, they will just take over. And that is definitely something we would call invasive. Biodiversity refers to the variety and variability of life on earth. Biodiversity typically, but not exclusively, measures the numbers of different species in an ecosystem. And if the ecosystem is dominated by more native plants than it is going to be by definition healthier. That's where we're working from here. So what are some of the threats to biodiversity? Um, I was taught in school the acronym HIPPO, that's where we're going to get this, uh, if you've ever heard that. The H in HIPPO is habitat loss. Uh, Illinois is the prairie state and we've lost well over 99 percent of our prairie and so we have to replace it, we have non-native kind of forest ecosystems, parking lots, urban areas that allow different types of animals, different types of communities to thrive. And so by changing the habitat, you change the collection of animals and plants that can benefit from that. And therefore you're, you're losing that nativity. Goes without saying that invasive species are a threat to environmental health. 
Uh, it's estimated that in the United States, there are 5,000 invasive uh, plant species, and they cause a lot of damage. Pictured here are the Japanese beetles that, that will just eat and defoliate things. There are Asian longhorn beetles. There are uh, gypsy moths. There are just thousands and thousands of species that are considered invasive. And it does go both ways. I should mention that uh, our little fuzzy gray squirrels that are here in Illinois, uh, they're an invasive species in England. They're running rampant over some of the parks in England and they don't like them there. They're, they thrive here and they're fine, but you take them out of their, of their natural environment and they become invasive. So it does go both ways. Another threat to environmental health is pollution. Um, there is a lot of plastic trash, especially in the uh, Chicago River, and that changes the aspect of the habitat and harms animals and plants that try to grow in the Chicago River. Just the sheer number of people we have on the planet, human population, uh, as you can see from the image that you, you were taking up potentially valuable habitat for animals and plants. And just so by having that many people on the planet, it puts a burden on the planet to sustain other populations. Along with that is to feed and clothe and, and uh, you know, have everybody thrive in their, their lives. We have to over harvest the environment and the earth to allow everybody to have a nice life. And so this actually puts a burden on the planet as well. It's just something to think about uh, sustainability and how you eat and plan your life and what you consume and what you buy uh, in terms of the amount of packaging and all that. I don't want to get too preachy, but these are the threats to biodiversity. I promise by the end of the presentation we'll be much more on a positive note. So why do we restore, and by we I mean Friends of the Chicago River, but also Friends of the Forest Preserve, Forest Preserve District, why do we all restore uh, the ecosystems? Well, it's for one, to strengthen biodiversity. What we just talked about, we want to make that as strong as we can. And by biodiversity, I mean ecosystem biodiversity. Uh, we've lost 68% of our forests in Illinois. We've lost 99% of our prairies. We've lost 90% of our quality wetlands. And so with all of that gone, we need to, to strengthen those foundations for the ecosystem so that we can have species diversity. And this is the one that everybody thinks about with species. In terms of animals, we have like 58 mammals, uh, 383 bird species, 174 fish species, 104 reptiles and amphibians, and well over uh, 27,000 types of insects and invertebrates, and then you talk about bacteria and fungi, and there are many, many animals and other plants that grow in the ecosystem. We need to keep that diversity if we can. Plants specifically, there are about 3,800 plants in Illinois, but 1,400 of them are non-native, 300 are invasive, and there are 26 exotic weeds that are on the, the really bad list, like the uh, uh, most wanted poster you would see in the post office. Uh, and those include buckthorn and honeysuckle and kudzu and things like that. Um, and I mentioned before, there are approximately 5,000 invasive plants in the United States, and they cause anywhere from $25 billion of damage annually. So this, there is a cost to having non-native species in your ecosystem. And the last, the one we don't think about very often is genetic diversity. As we, you know, separate these ecosystems and split them apart into smaller pieces, we have populations of animals and plants that will become, uh, they'll begin to diverge genetically because they're separated. Uh, much like the, I, I had the original example on here of the finches on the Galapagos, uh, with Darwin studying those. And um, that's not a great example because it's not here in, in Illinois. Uh, and so I threw up a picture of the white-tailed deer here. There is uh, a great danger to them becoming uh, genetically less diverse because the populations of deer exist together in small groups, and so they only breed with each other, and you, don't, you lose diversity, genetic diversity that way. 
humans actually do sometimes contribute to genetic uh, undiversification. Uh, I think of dog species like your bulldog that is bred to have uh, a nice, you know, real flat nose. Everybody loves that, but that causes problems with their breeding. Uh, but yet we're creating that through genetic uh, undiversification. We also restore to restore uh, ecosystem function. Uh, biodiverse ecosystems that are healthy are able to control flooding and other events like when a hurricane hits or there's a fire, uh, it's able to bounce back faster. It helps us cl combat climate change. It strengthens our food webs. If you have more diversity, you have more connections in the food web and it provides more food and energy for the ecosystem. It creates and connects habitat. If we split, split everything up and these habitats are, are not connected, animals can't travel between habitats and it becomes uh, less diverse. So we wanna to try to reconnect those, which all allows natural succession and ecosystems to function as they should. And lastly, um, if none of, that, none of the rest of that convinced you, I just wanted to throw some human considerations on there. We all care about clean water and clean air and biodiverse or restored ecosystems have increased water and air quality. They're also more beautiful. They also provide greater human health, pro uh, provide opportunities to get out and exercise and have clean air. Uh, they also provide potential medications. We don't know what animals might be out there or plants that might contain some kind of chemical compound that might be a potential medication. And if we're getting rid of all of these animals and plants, we might lose some of that. There are many medications that have been derived from the natural world that have uh, a great benefit to a lot of humans. And lastly, um, an economic value. A, a restored ecosystem actually does have an economic value. The uh, improvements that we've made along the Chicago River, we did a study about five years ago or so, that for every dollar we spend on restoring and improving the Chicago River system, uh, it returns a $1.79 uh, invest on the investment. So it's a, a, a 79 cents over every dollar return on investment. So, and we have that study if you'd like to see it. So Friends has restoration as part of its mission uh, and has been doing it for many, many years. There are, I'm going to separate our restoration projects into a couple different categories to kind of make sense of them. Uh, first, of all, uh, first of all are our contracted work. So this would be work that is on quite a large scale and Friends, uh, because it involves large machinery or a large area, or an area that maybe Buckthorn is 100% of the cover, we've contracted it out to have them actually come in and clear it, um, restore it, and then we actually monitor and make sure it's, it's doing well. This would include our uh, turtle habitat, which has been to date 152 acres across five different sites. I think we're expanding to a sixth, maybe in a year or two. Uh, but these would be areas that are pretty secluded down along the river and are ch choked with buckthorn and other invasives, which was a, an impediment to turtles getting up on shore and reproducing. And so we have contractors just come in and basically clear cut all the buckthorn, which allows the turtles to go up on land and actually reproduce. Uh, Crooked Creek is another current prog pro uh, program. We're partnering with the forest preserves of Cook County to clear 207 acres of invasive species, uh, and, and that's been going well. We also have uh, other habitat projects that aren't really acres of land, but they are providing habitat, which in turn provides biodiversity. We're uh, fostering bats in the forest preserve, osprey, uh, and fish habitat in the Chicago River. We'll mention that if you're really interested in the osprey, we actually just had the first nesting pair on a pole down in Bobian Woods. Uh, and you can actually see that. We actually have a video about it or you can just go down and view them if you want. Uh, so that has been a great success. After f finally five years, we finally have a nesting pair of osprey on a pole. 
Uh, and then we also partner with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and other people to do dam removal on the Chicago River. That is a restoration project. But all of that is, like I said, contracted work. So let's get on to the more uh, hands-on volunteer projects that Friends is involved in. Uh, we recently had a bunch of volunteers go into the Chicago River on the North Shore Channel in Skokie Evanston and planted plants, the uh, uh, lizard's tail and, and water willow down in the, the actual side of the river. You can see a volunteer doing that there in the picture. And they planted just thousands of plants, 4,500 4, plants and those are growing and they're gonna prov provide fish habitat uh, and nutrients for actually for the river. We have our crew program, which is the Chicago River Eco Warriors and our litter free program, which picks up trash. Uh, those do help biodiversity and habitat. And then of course this program, Chicago River Day, uh, gets thousands of people out at 60 different sites, 70 different sites along the river to clean up the river and do restoration projects that are all very important. But the rest of the program, I'd kind of like to highlight the, uh, probably the jewel of this, of the whole program, which is our Centennial Volunteers. And the Centennial Volunteers were created in 2014 as a partnership with the Forest Preserves, hence Centennial. The, the Forest Preserves were created in 1914 and so this is the 100th anniversary of their creation. And that's why we call it Centennial Volunteers. But it has been able to garner 11,000 plus volunteers, uh, volunteer in 2019. And we had uh, over 250 acres worked on across six sites this last year. At its core, it's a partnership between many organizations uh, that support the Centennial Volunteers, the Forest Preserves themselves, uh, the Field Museum and Friends of the Forest Preserves are very instrumental in getting a lot of that. We all have a kind of a shared calendar, uh, work days. We, we kind of reinforce each other and help support each other in this way. The program is really unique in that it provides a path to stewardship uh, we bring volunteers in um, who maybe don't know a lot, maybe have never done restoration, and if they want to get more involved, they can learn how to do uh, workday leadership, plant identification, how to run a chainsaw, how to do restoration, work with the forest preserves. So they, they, you almost get taken under the, a mentor's wing and you can be trained and eventually maybe even actually run a site. And it Centennial Volunteers was also a way of concentrating our restoration efforts. By having uh, just a few sites that we all concentrate on, we're actually able to show that you can make a big impact at a forest reserve if you have sustained work at the same site over a long period of time. Rather than spreading the work out amongst dozens of sites and you're making very little impact. And the general work plan is to remove invasives and plant natives. So we do a lot of native seed collection and removal of invasives, specifically buckthorn, garlic mustard, lesser celadine, things like that. So I'd like to just show you some pictures. These are some we had from another presentation uh, on what a typical uh, Centennial Volunteers workday might look like. Uh, Here's uh, Josh Coles, who actually works for Friends of the Chicago River back in his days when he worked for Friends of the Forest Preserve, welcoming everybody to a work day. And you can see you just get everybody on the same page and, and define what you're going to be doing that day and, and encourage and thank everybody. That's very important with volunteers. Get to work removing uh, non-natives. Here they are, some volunteers cutting down buckthorn and some green ash and other plants that are not, not, not wanted. Uh, everything, all, all the work that is done fits in with a management plan. So the Forest Preserves comes up with a plan as to what they want the site to look like and, and how they want the work to progress. And the stewards, the people in charge of the site, actually will direct the work towards that end. So all of the work that you see here is approved and, and condoned by the Forest Preserves. 
Here are volunteers spreading native seeds, collecting native seeds. Uh, in between, what they usually do is collect seed in the fall and then they sort it and clean it uh, in the winter and then redistribute it in the, in the springtime. And it is a very thoughtful process. We don't want to distribute seed to somewhere where, again, it doesn't belong, it's not native to that ecosystem. And so usually seeds are kept on the same site or, or an adjacent site that is approved. It all has to be approved by the forest preserves. Um, there's a group in the upper right working on a deer enclosure to see what plants can be planted and the, and the fencing is to keep the deer and other animals from browsing it. And there's a girl in the lower left putting up a duck box. So that's also improving habitat and diversity. Break time. I don't think I need to explain this one. I think they're all eating s'mores or granola bars or something like that. It's important. It is important to build a community. The plant community is important, but also the human community when you have volunteers. So we do things like bird walks um, and just plant identification walks or bio blitzes, uh, lots of different activities just to build community and let people get to know each other. Of course, we clean up every site. Whenever we're done with a site, we always pile up all the invasives, let them dry out. We would actually burn them during an approved time. But all the trash and everything we take in, we take out, uh, leave no trace, make sure that the habitat is in better shape than when we got there. Here are some of our stewards. I mentioned them earlier. I probably should move this slide up, but. Uh, they are the direct liaison with the forest preserves. They, they work sometimes often for the forest preserves and they direct the work that is being done at the site. And you can see there the gentleman is actually uh, getting ready to chainsaw, which is another one of the jobs. Uh, Sawyers is, are a name for a person who runs a saw and safety spotters. So we're always concerned with safety, but we, we cut down bigger trees, anything that's bigger than like four inches in diameter we'll use a chainsaw on, otherwise you can use a handsaw. There's always a burn boss on site, somebody to actually watch over the fire and make sure it's out, somebody who can stay behind during the, after the work day to make sure that the fire is safe and uh, no longer a danger. Sometimes if you're out walking in the forest preserves, you'll see signs that say uh, hot coals, uh, and that is just because a burn had happened maybe a day or two ahead of that time. And then specifically with buckthorn, if you uh, cut buckthorn, it actually has a, a regrowth potential where the, the stump will actually regrow 20, stump, 20 shoots where you cut down one tree, you'll now have 20. So what we wanna do is actually put on an herbicide. Uh, in most cases, it's garlon, and we actually will herbicide the stumps after the workday is done so that the buckthorn will not regrow. So that's another job that if you wanted to learn how to do and get trained for it, you could. A big shout out to all of our volunteers, everybody who has volunteered, the uh, uh, 11,000 people that volunteered just last year. That's very big and big part of getting these ecosystems in good shape. Uh, and you can see in the picture down below, we actually obtained some native plants and it's obviously they're getting ready to, to plant them. The shovels are right there and everything. So where does all this work take place? Well, over the years, since 2016, we have had 10 Centennial Volunteer Sites. There are six currently, but we have had 10 in the program. And the reason some have been graduated out is because they've um, got such a great uh, plant community and also a human community to work on it. And they're in a good place and they're running themselves that we will go ahead and graduate them out so that they can do their own work and that we'll put the more effort into the sites that need it more. But um, there are, have, there have been in the 10, there have been six on the north side, four on the south side. Uh, here they are in alphabetical order, but I'll tell you the north side is Blue Star, uh, Clayton Smith, Forest Glen. On the south side, we have Bobby and Kickapoo. Other north side sites have been Laba Woods, uh, Wiz Waters Meat Woods, and on the south side, River Oaks and Whistler. Uh, and Soam Woods is there, it's on the north side. 
it, it's probably the, uh, the, the best, the highest quality site that we've seen in the program. It was in the very first year and got graduated after just uh, 18 months in the program. So there's a group of people up there working on native plants that are doing really a really great job. So I want to kind of turn our attention to the rest of the way as to how we evaluate a site for its native plant community and whether it's doing, whether we're doing a good job. Uh, the evaluation process is important. I've been going out for five years to look at plant communities and specifically the Centennial Volunteer sites to see if they are improving, staying the same, or even getting worse. So and by and large, they've been improving. We do that through uh, a floristic quality assessment, which is a vegetation-based assessment tool. Uh, and that gives us a floristic quality index, which is a number that we measure the ecological condition or habitat with. So sometimes I'll talk about FQA or FQI. One is the actual process and the other one is the actual number that we get. And uh, I'll be covering this later, but floristic quality index, uh, to totally bore you right now, this is actually, it's the uh, mean C or coefficient of conservatism uh, times the square root of the number of native plants. So that sounds very boring, I know, but we'll talk about how you actually calculate that. And we'll be doing the calculation. Like I said, the floristic quality index is based on a coefficient of conservatism. Is everybody familiar with like a zero to 10 scale? Like you say something is a, is a 10, it's really good, or a zero, it's really bad. Well, that's exactly what the coefficient of conservatism is. If you took every plant that you might find out in the ecosystem and say, how well does this plant play with others? Is it really native to the ecosystem? Can it exist nowhere else? If that's true, then it's like a 10, a nine or a 10. If it's non-native or it's uh, a kind of a generalist or, core, or it could exist in a lot of different ecosystems and it's not all that special, it's probably gonna be a zero or a one. And by definition, all non-native or invasive plants are a zero. Does that make sense to everybody? To do the assessment and calculate the floristic quality index, uh, Friends of the Chicago River used a uh, calculator, an FQA calculator from the Army Corps of Engineers. And this is available to anybody. Um, and I put up the link there, and I know you can't click on it, but if you Google US Army Corps of Engineers Chicago FQA, it'll come right up. If you do floristic quality US Army Corps of Engineers, it'll come right up, it'll be the first thing. So if you're interested in playing around with that and seeing maybe take a survey of your backyard and put all those plants into the calculator and tell you how, how quality your backyard is. So how do we do the assessment out in the forest preserves? Well, what we do is a rapid floristic quality assessment, which means that I'll map out the forest preserve, I'll pick a good transect, and I will just simply walk the uh, transect through the work site and look at the plant community, which plants are in higher uh, cat or higher uh, uh, percentage cover as uh, than others, and make sure I note each one so that I can look them up later. Sampling is always done during the growing season from May to September. So just to show you a real world example, this is real world. This was the map from. 2016 at Blue Star Memorial Woods. At the time, they had already removed buckthorn from the blue areas right there. So they'd already moved eight, removed 8.9 acres of buckthorn. They had done some seeding in the purple area and they were planning on doing removal of buckthorn in the red area right there, it's four acres. And so that being the, the, the section that was planned on being worked, that's where I did my transect. So I actually mapped out a transect to come somewhat cover the area. And it ended up being about 1400 feet that I had to walk. And I just simply walked that and calculated all the plants. 
So you can see the transects at the, at the sites at the time, they averaged somewhere around 1,000 feet. So this was a longer than average transect. And I had my field guide and I had a note pad and I had a clock. And all I did was I just kept trying to, to, to go at least uh, 10, mount, or 10 feet per minute. That way I could get through the whole thing in about an hour, hour and a half. But you wanna do a, mi mi a minimum of 30 minutes and uh, uh, probably at least an hour. And af after, after that hour, every 10 minutes or so, if you're not seeing any new plants, then you can, you can call it a day and be done. So you just kind of want to walk the site and make sure that you're calculating everything, you're seeing everything. Percent native coverage, we're going to do some math here. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, you calculate like the number of times you see a plant or maybe sometimes I'll do a quadrat just to kind of get an estimate of how much a plant is covering the area. To give you an idea, Plot A and plot B, we're going to cover one with green dots that is going to be equivalent of about 15%, and the other one is 30%. So you can see how much like 15% means, how much 30% means. Uh, I think we can all picture zero and 100%. But percent native coverage is another metric other than FQI. FQI. Uh, percent native, cover native coverage does not measure native plant diversity. It could be covered with uh, Kentucky bluegrass, for instance, or buckthorn. It could be 100% covered, but that is not native. If you put a patch of dirt in a section, that doesn't change the uh, native coverage because it's still land. It's just not covered by anything. However, if you have a site that has a body of water in it, that does change the percent of land that you have. It actually makes that same... 15% uh, becomes 17 because you're actually calculating the 15% over 90 co coverage. So it becomes 70. For instance, and this happens all the time, on plot B, if you have a canopy cover, an erasious and a shrub cover that is actually more than 100%, if you have a super coverage of a site, uh, something that used to be 30, actually becomes 30 out of 110, which is more like 27%. So you do have to think about what, how much the plant coverage is of the site. All right, mean C. That's a big nasty equation up in the upper right, but all it basically means is you put all the C values for each plant you see and divide it by the number of native plants you have. So it's just an average. Uh, I know it looks really terrible, but it's really just an average. Um, Mean C is good for comparing a site, the same site over time, a simple measure of the mean or average of plant quality, but it doesn't really account for bare soil or non-natives or diversity. So it's just a number and we're going to use it to calculate the FQI later. Let me show you what I mean. If you have a site that is a monoculture, it's covered by the same plant and each plant is a five. This is why every five is blue because they're all the same plant the mean C is five, because it's five divided by however many fives you have, it doesn't matter, right? It's five. If a, you have a plot and you have a bunch of dirt and you have some non-native species that are a zero and you have one plant that is a five and you divide by the number of native plants, it's just five divided by one, it's still a five. So in terms of mean C, these two sites are equivalent. However, take another example, if you have a site that is almost the same as plot A, it's all fives, but you have a four, a six, and a three, the five, the four, and the six, and the three all count equally. So if you uh, average the mean Cs of those plants, you actually get a 4.5. It actually drops the quality. And, all, listen, and watch this, if we change the one three to a seven, all of a sudden our mean C jumps up to 5.5. So just that little change can, can really change the mean C. Just something to think about. And here's the really the one I want you to remember. The, the floristic quality index is mean C multiplied by the, the square root of the number of native plants. So it takes that mean C value, which is a good indicator of quality, but then it actually puts a component of diversity on top of it. 
So this is the best metric we really have for uh, looking at plant quality, but also looking at somewhat of diversity. So how much of something we have. Just to throw up some examples, if we have uh, plot A with all the fives again, that's a FQA, FQI of five. Plot B, if we have a bunch of fives but some non-natives in there, it's still an FQI of five. But then if we have all fives but they're two different species, the FQI will rise to seven. If we have five different species, all of a sudden it goes up to 11. And if we have perfect diversity where they're all fives, it's just like the other site, but each one is a different plant, our FQI is now 25. So diversity really does come through and that's one of the goals of the program is to look at diversity. And the perfect thing to do mathematically is to combine FQI and native covers so that from now on, we're actually gonna look at how much something is covering the area and how diverse it is. So we're gonna look at FQI and native coverage together. Over the last five years, I have seen a lot of plants in the forest preserve. Uh, the murderer's row of non-native species, the ones I see the most often are actually on the right there. So just to name a few, you can see buckthorn, honeysuckle, Japanese knotweed, Canada thistle is pervasive almost everywhere. Uh, creeping yellow wood sorrel is one I see quite often. Uh, lesser celadine, if it's a wet area, is probably one of the most pervasive. Uh, Lily of the Valley is all, all over Labau Woods and Forest Glen. You see it in there quite often. Uh, that's something that a lot of people use as a flower in uh, wedding ceremonies, and I think they wanted to actually go plant it out in the forest preserves, and that's how it got loose. Uh, and reed canary grass is everywhere, too. But buckthorn is probably number one. Some of the sites, if, if no work has been done at a site, buckthorn can be anywhere up to 40 to 50% of a forest preserve. Uh, quite often when you look out into a forest preserve and you see a lot of green, it looks great, that's buckthorn. So just something to think about. Um, in terms of native species, I do see a lot of those. Some of the more common ones are uh, some of the trees, black cherry, cottonwood, are very common, red oak and white oak. Um, some of the understory, you see a lot of Virginia creeper, poison ivy, which is actually native. A lot of people hate poison ivy, but it is actually a native plant. Uh, Solomon seal, golden alexanders, jewelweed is everywhere during, you know, the April and May season. Virginia knotweed, wild geranium is a very common wildflower in the forest, and wild bergamot is a very common prairie plant just saw some the other day at Whistler Woods. In terms of percentages, um, generally the forest preserves turn to be, tend to be about 30% non-native and 70% native. The list of plants that I have personally seen over the last five years is I think 355 of them that I could identify. And of that, it's, a, it's like 69.5% native and 30.5% non-native. The native plants actually turn out to be about a, a mean C of 5.2 if you average them all together. So overall, um, if we didn't have the non-natives in our ecosystem, we would have a pretty good uh, habitat in the forest preserves. So just getting rid of the non-natives is a big step. Um, and then if we can actually sprinkle a few other no, uh, native plants in there, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, the forest preserves tend to be mostly wildflowers uh, because we have a lot of uh, savannas and open prairies, grassy areas and things like that. But we do have a significant portion of trees. And uh, in terms of native sedges, I've seen probably about 20 native sedges. There aren't any non-native sedges. But vines, ferns, grasses, and shrubs make up a lot of the forest preserves. When I'm out, the, again, this is from the murderer's row list. If you look at invasive trees, some of the worst ones are probably ailanthus and white poplar. And if we can take those and replace them with some natives, I would choose so, uh, sugar maples, red oaks, black cherry, or cottonwood. Those are all very good native trees. If we look at invasive or non-native shrubs, 
by far and away the number one is buckthorn, European buckthorn. Um, I didn't say before, but European buckthorn was actually brought here by uh, immigrants from Europe as a way to create a hedge around their farms and keep other animals out. It, it grows in a very thick hedge with, with thorns. So it's a very, um, um, it's a nice barrier between properties and whatnot. And it got loose and it's now everywhere in the forest preserves. Uh, that's a really bad one. Uh, Amur honeysuckle or bush honeysuckle is another bad one. There are native honeysuckles, uh, but this, we're talking about the non-native one that grows red berries and whatnot. Native shrubs that I would replace those with would be, a good ones would be elderberry, uh, dogwood, prairie rose, uh, raspberry cane is very nice because it provides berries and fruit for other animals. Some of our non-native grasses and vines, you have reed canary grass and Asiatic bittersweet. Uh, reed canary grass is in probably about every forest preserve you go to, you'll find some there. And it'd be good to replace some of those with uh, wild rye, uh, meadow brome is a great one. I think that's actually a nine or a 10, if I remember right, on the C scale. Virginia creeper and riverbank grape are, again, great sources of food for, for wild animals. If you go to a marshy or a wet area, you'll see a lot of lesser celadine. Uh, there are a lot of little yellow flowers out there. Lesser celadine is one of the few ones with little heart-shaped leaves and eight petals. That's how you can tell that one. It's a non-native. Canada thistle is again just in about every forest preserve. Uh, spiny leaves with a purple flower. And I would replace those forbs with wildly wild geranium, sink foil, which has a little five petal uh, flower, wild bergamot, uh, and American germander. And the last one of these slides that I wanted to show you, some of the non-native forbs and sedges would be your common wood sorrel uh, and yellow and white sweet clover are just about everywhere as well. We can get rid of those and put in common oak sedges. Golden Alexander is a great plant. Uh, Rattlesnake Master is, is similar. Uh, fall Sunflower is a great plant to have and uh, Snake Root is another good cover. So you may be asking what were the results for the, some of the surveys that we did. I want to share just some of the data from the last five years. And if you look at a graph of FQI and native coverage, I'm going to put every site that we surveyed on this graph. FQI is going to get better the higher up the graph we go. And native coverage obviously is going to get better the closer we get to 100%. So if you look at, at quadrats on the, the plant data, if something is in quadrant one in the upper right, um, then it, it's in fairly good condition. It's gonna have a high quality and diversity. It's also gonna have a low non-native population. So it's gonna be very diverse and native. So I would say for that area, just continued work and seed collection, just to bolster again the native population as we're going along. If something is in quadrat two or three, if it's in two, it really is good quality, but it's got a very uh, low native coverage. So we would wanna probably get rid of the invasives. If something is in three, it's got very few non-natives, but it's not of good quality. So we probably just wanna add seeds to it. Uh, and then if something is in four, it's gonna be considered neither native nor of high quality. So we wanna move everything from four to two, three, and try to eventually get everything up into category one. And you may be asking how I, did I arbitrarily put these values on here? Where, where does the cross come from? Well, the very first year we did the survey, here's the data from 2006. If you took the mean or the average of all the, the FQI and all of the native coverage, that puts the mean right at about 17 and 50. So the cross where the, the quadrats come together, that X, that is right where the mean is. So it should have the same amount above and below for each category. And so we actually see, because Laba and Soam were so good, we actually see more sites in category four uh, and only Soam and Laba were up in category one. 
And it's not surprising that those two sites have already been graduated out of the program. Uh, and so I have data from each year and hopefully you can just see the trend of how they move. Let's go to 2017. This was after the very first year of work and you can see almost everything improved tremendously. We had a, in that first year, we had a five point jump in average FQI and everything was above 60% native after removing all the buckthorn. 2018 saw continued improvement. 2019 and I will say for 2019, the only reason that Blue Star is back down in category four, you can see if I go back to 2018, Blue Star is up in category one. That's because that transect at Blue Star, we graduated and we went to a new site that was like being at a totally new site with no, with no work having been done or anything. That's why it dropped back down to four. And if you keep your eye on that Blue Star, dot look what happened after we did one year of work there in 2000 or in 2020 this year it's back up in category one so i guess the the takeaway for me is that volunteer work volunteer hours in the forest reserves cutting buckthorn does really improve the habitat it's a proven thing and this to me is one of the most interesting graphs right here Again, if we take the, the red tri or the red square is the mean for the very first year, the yellow square would be a 10, a two point increase in FQI and a 10% increase in percent native coverage. And the green square is a four point increase and a 20% increase in native coverage. So again, we're trying to get things up into that category. If we look at 2016, there's the distribution of sites. And you can just see as we go through the years here how things migrate towards the green box. It's just another visual way of looking at something rather than just the averages. And by 2020, we had, I think all but one site was in the green box. And that was Whistler, which was right on the border. So they were almost in all there. It was, I think, exactly, almost exactly a four-point increase in FQI. If you are more of a numbers person, these are the charts for the native coverage. So the very first year we started, we, we, count, we found about 46% natives. Uh, Buckthorn was something like 40% that year. Uh, and by 2020, we're at almost 70% native. And Buckthorn itself, I think, was I calculated as about 6% of those sites. Now, Buckthorn is still everywhere, but at these work sites, it's gone down significantly. In terms of FQI, we've seen an increase every year. Um, and part of that is just seeing more and more plants as we get rid of the buckthorn, more stuff is, more other plants are coming in. We see different plants and it's just, it, the FQI keeps going up every year. Uh, eventually there probably will be a plateau. Okay, so now to the real fun part. Um, I just wanted to end today with a uh, simulation of an actual survey. So we're gonna do what I do when I go out and do a survey really crudely on the screen. I also shared, um, uh, hopefully there was an email and I shared in the chat that there's a link to these cards if you actually want to print them out and play this game with kids or just do it yourself with your family or something. You can actually create a forest preserve, uh, populate it with plants and then play around with how native they are, how non-native, what the actual FQI is, you can actually go ahead and calculate that. So we are going to pretend we're walking this, this plot and it's gonna have a, a floodplain, a prairie and a woodland. And we're gonna identify the plants. We just have the cards out on the screen. And we're actually gonna calculate the, the mean C, the coefficient of conservatism value for just the native plants. We're gonna ignore the non-natives. And we're gonna multiply by the square root of the number of native plants we have. So. Uh, I don't know how good everybody is with math, but you're welcome to try. 
Um, put your answers in the chat if you can. And let's show you that these are the plants that we're gonna have. So if we wanted to calculate our floristic quality index for these plants, we would calculate it by, uh, first of all, you can see all the non-natives have the yellow highlighted non-native in it. So we can ignore those. So what do we have left? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plants. They are all different. If there was a duplicate, we would just count it once. But so we're gonna have seven native plants. And if I'm doing my math correctly, we're gonna count two, four, five, nine, 10, 14, 18, right? So 18 divided by seven. I knew I should have made this come out better so it wasn't so hard. Eighteen divided by seven, I'm getting a mean C of about two point six for this population. Now we if we multiply by the square root of seven, we get a floristic quality index. I got one of six point eight for this population of plants. Does that make sense for everybody? So now we're gonna do the simulation. We have to ask, do we wanna restore anything? Do you wanna replace any of the plants? I'm gonna show you the same group of plants and we're gonna flip some over if you want. But if we flip it, we can't flip it back. So if we take something out and we replace it, we're stuck with whatever we have. And we're gonna do the same calculation over, mean C multiplied by the square root of the native plants. And we're gonna see if our FQ is higher or lower than 6.8. So I'm gonna try to, I'm actually going to try to unmute everybody. It doesn't look like I can. Oh, okay. Well, there's the... Let's just do it this way then. Here's our same population. All right, if you want me to change a plant, go ahead and type the name into the chat and I'll flip it. See, we'll see if this works. Are there any of these non-natives that you would like to get rid of? Amy says get rid of the buckthorn. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Let's see what we get. Oh no, we got common milkweed. It's native, but it's a zero. I don't know if that shocks anybody else, but to me, I've always thought of common milkweed as a great plant because uh, monarch butterflies are dependent upon it. You, know, you think of it as, as, a, as an important plant for the monarch butterfly and everything, but it's actually in terms of its conservatism is a zero. And I think that's because it's found in so many different places. It's very common. Is there another one that you would like to try? The plantain? Natalie says get rid of the plantain. Yeah, plantain, if you ever, if you're walking along, especially a trail, and you see a little, it's kind of a round leaf and there's a stalk, a seed stalk that comes up, um, that is your plantain. It loves open dirt areas, what we call waste places. So let, let's get rid of the plantain. Oh, we got garlic mustard. The clover, Nicole says, get rid of the clover. White sweet clover, oh, it becomes a black oak. So we have a six, we have an improvement there. I 
I think we're eventually probably just going to hit all the non-natives here. Uh, Janet says get rid of the white poplar, which is, that's an easy one to identify. If you're ever walking out in the forest preserves and you see a really tall uh, tree, uh, the leaves of the white poplar love to, to, to flash back and forth in the wind. If it's a windy day, you'll see the leaves flashing uh, green, white, green, white. That's because the top side of the leaf is green, but the underside is a grayish, uh, paler color. And so it almost looks like it's blinking at you. And there, we got a sugar maple instead. That's, a, that's an improvement. Anybody want me to go for the multiflora rose? Make it a clean sweep? Sure. Amy says sure. Okay. Let's do it. Oh, good. We got some golden Alexanders. That's a seven. That's a big jump. So we have two other ones. There's a black cherry and a pokeweed. We could take a chance on making them better. It might make it worse. You never know. Somebody might have designed it worse. Are we going to call it a day? Are we done with our restoration work day? Let's see. Let's go ahead, for, the, for everybody's sake, because I don't want to bore everybody too much, let's go ahead and calculate our FQI based on what we have here now. So if we have, we now have 11 native species, and they are all different. And if I go through them top left to lower right, we have a, a 2 to 9. 15, 17, 18, 22, 25, 26, 30, 34. So if we have 34 divided by 11, our mean C has jumped up to 3, 3.1. And if we then multiply by the square root of the 11 native species, we've gone, our FQI has gone up to 10.3. So we've had we've seen an increase just by changing those five plants from 6.8 to 10.3. So I don't know if I would call that fun, but I hope you had fun doing some of that. Um, we're actually going to end here. If if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. I will say that if you're interested in in obtaining these cards and printing them out and playing with them. Um, they're on the Friends of Chicago Rivers website, chicagoriver.org. Um, the link is there, but it's, it's really unwieldy and long. But again, if you just Google Chicago River Centennial Volunteers, it should bring up the page that it is on. And if you want to email me specifically to get the link uh, in a link that you can just click on, you're certainly welcome to email me at mhauser at chicagoriver.org. Uh, so we will end there. Again, a big thank you to Shelsey and Birch Biscuit Company for today's presentation. Um, I will stick around as long as needed to answer everybody's questions in the chat. But otherwise, uh, thank you for attending and you're free to uh, go and have a great weekend.